and my Redeemer is. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. What joy this blessed assurance gives. Cause I know that my Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're tuning in to our service here at Resurrection Oakland Church this morning. Um, we have the hope and the assurance that our Redeemer lives, that he lives triumphant from the grave. And so we're going to stand up. We're going to rise up together as we're able and proclaim that story, proclaim that good news. So let's stand and respond to his call from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord glory. We, we ascribe, ascribe to, to the, the Lord's Lord strength. strength. Ascribe to him the glory due to his name, Jesus Christ. We, we worship, worship Jesus in all his holiness. Lord, grant us strength to worship because, because you are the eternal, eternal King, always worthy of praise. praise.
Every knee. Every knee will bow before the line. Take it home. chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. In our faith, we have something to look forward to. God has given us his word, his son, all of himself. Let us remember now who we are, who our God is, and what he has done for us. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. together there's no one higher than you redeemer defender our great and mighty savior there's no one higher than you you are always with us gracious to forgive us by your power been set free Cause Lord we stand amazed in your presence Astounded by your mercy and love Our hands are lifted high and surrendered Your grace for me is always enough there is no one higher than our God. There is no one greater than you. So let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than Your beauty, your splendor, your 
Good morning. We come now to our time of confession. And during this season of Lent, we have been using this time of confession to get very specific, to, be, to get very particular about our sins. And we've, we've confessed our pride. We've confessed our hypocrisy. We've confessed our, our failure to care for the poor. All these things that the Bible talks a lot about. This morning, we're going to confess our greed. And uh, greed is kind of like, it's kind of like your junk drawer at home. You just, you never get around to dealing with it because you just get used to it. Um, Jesus says something really interesting about greed in Luke chapter 12. He says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Jesus doesn't talk that way about any other sin, but about greed, he says, watch out. Why? Well, because it's much harder to identify than other sins. It's much more sneaky. Money has this deceptive power. It has a blinding power. But, but Christianity says that greed is an incredibly big deal. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul says that the root of all evil is the love of money. Greed is at the root of why we fail to love God and one another. Uh, greed is what is undoing us and is what un it's undoing our world and therefore we need to deal with it but unlike your junk drawer greed is not a do-it-yourself project it, it's not a project that we can tackle on our own and the reason is because greed is not ultimately a financial issue but it is a heart issue and confession is like heart surgery Confession is where God comes to us as a surgeon who cuts us, who cuts us to the very quick, to the very core. But he cuts us not to hurt us, but to heal us, to, to slay our greed, and get this, to make us more like him, which is generous. God is generous, and he calls us to be generous. Let me invite you to join me now in this prayer of confession. You can respond in the all parts. Heavenly Father, we confess the sin of our greed, for it has been in our greed that we have loved our money and possessions more than we have loved you. We confess that we lost sight of our first love. We yearn to receive your gifts rather than to receive you, the good giver. In our greed, we have trusted our money and possessions to be the source of strength, security, and happiness. We confess that we have tried to serve two masters. We have said that we love you, but our actions have displayed a love of comfort and worldly possessions instead. In our greed, we have hoarded our money and possessions from the church, from the poor, and from the work of your kingdom in our city and in our world. We have misspent resources that should have been given to those in need, you have been generous to us, but we have been stingy towards you. Forgive us, search our hearts, and show us where we have been blind to our greed. Bring us to repentance and heal us. Set us free in the joy of generosity so that we might serve you and others with all that we have been given. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to take just a moment now and to make this prayer very personal, to make this confession personal as you confess silently in your own home. Hear now these words of assurance from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became, yet, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. In Christ and because of Christ, we have all the riches of God's love and his grace and his forgiveness that we could ever hope for 
Let me invite you to stand as we respond to that good news now together. everyone. My name is Izzy and I am reporting here from the South Berkeley Community Group and I'm so excited to welcome you to church this Sunday morning. Especially if you're new, we want to welcome you. We at Resurrection Oakland are a community that seeks to love and to serve our community just as Jesus did. If you're new, sign up for our weekly emails. We send about one email a week and you'll stay up to date with things going on in the life of our church as well as important health and safety tips during this time. Second, now that the state of California has allowed churches to worship together in person, we are excited to gather again for a communion service. Our next service is Sunday, March 14th, which is today at 4 p.m. Space is limited to 75 people, so register at resoakland.com by clicking the button that says Sunday evening communion service. And you can read more about our health and safety precautions on the FAQ page on the website. If for some reason you aren't able to attend or you don't feel comfortable attending, we can also, or we will also live stream this service. Third, I am so excited that we will begin gathering again in person every week starting on Easter Sunday. On Easter, there will be two masked and socially distant services with RSVPs required. Services will also have a live stream option for those unable or who are uncomfortable attending. And registration for this will begin Monday, March 15th, so stay tuned for that. With all of this exciting news being said, this is now the time for us to virtually greet one another. So I encourage you to go ahead and take out your phone and send a text to someone that you know. If you're new, subscribe and follow us on our social media and drop a comment in the live feed. We'd love to know that you're here and to say hello back to you. Happy Sunday.
morning, everyone. My name is Karina, and if you don't know me, I'm part of RUF Berkeley's college ministry, and I also help out with the Res Kids ministry as well. I'd love it if you join me in a reading from God's Word, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, the parable of the sower. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's take just a moment to pray together. Father, you tell us that you alone have the words of life. And those are the words that we need this morning. We don't need words of human wisdom. We certainly don't need my words. We need your words. We need your spirit to come and give us ears to hear those words and to make our hearts open to receive those words. Would you meet us wherever we are this morning? Convinced, unconvinced, somewhere in between, trying to figure out if we could ever believe these things, whether we feel close to you or far from you, whether our lives are filled with suffering or with joy, or we're just in a season of boredom and kind of going through the motions. God, we need you. And we need you to break into our lives again today with your word, and by your spirit. And so would you do it, we pray. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. When's the last time you stared at a gravestone? Probably not the happiest first sentence you've ever heard in a sermon, but uh, I find gravestones pretty fascinating. There's a large cemetery near our house, and before COVID hit, I used to run through this cemetery once a week, actually. It was kind of of my weekly reminder of my own mortality. The thing that fascinates me about gravestones is that all of them, every gravestone has three things. They have the date that someone was born, they have the date that someone died, and then in between these two dates is this tiny little dash. Their whole life comes down in the end to this tiny little dash. And you know, that is true for all of us. That's, that's, a, that's a sobering thing to think about. But here's something actually even more sobering, is that every single day, our actions, our pursuits, the things that we give our time to and our money to and our attention to, the things that we prioritize, the things that we daydream about and fantasize about, everything we do every single day comes down to what we think is going to give us the very best dash possible in the end. It comes down to what we think is going to create for us the most fulfilling life possible. What we think will give us a life well lived. In his book, A Guide to the Good Life, William Irving writes about the danger of misliving. And he says this, he says, there is a danger that you will mislive, that despite all your activity, 
despite all the pleasant diversions you might have enjoyed while alive, you will end up living a bad life. There is, in other words, a danger that when you are on your deathbed, you will look back and realize that you wasted your one chance at living. And instead of spending your life pursuing something genuinely valuable, you squandered it because you allowed yourself to be distracted by the various baubles life has to offer. Friends, Christianity, I want you to hear this. Christianity is not just about morality. It is not just about doctrine. It is not just about religious activity. It is about a life well lived. And a life well lived is what the Bible calls a fruitful life. It's what Galatians 5 means when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And a fruitful life is what Jesus is talking about in this story of four soils. Four soils that represent four kinds of lives, only the last of which bears any fruit. I love this parable, and the reason I love this parable is because it, 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 it captures the vision of our church. What is the vision of our church? We want to see lives transformed by the person of Jesus so that together we can learn to live in the way of Jesus, so that the fruit of his spirit would be produced in our lives, and so that the fruit of God's kingdom would be produced in our city. We, here here is the vision of our church, we want to cultivate fourth soil people. How do you live a fourth soil kind of life? See, you, you might be, younger in life and just trying to figure out how to live it well. You've got a lot of years ahead of you. You might be in midlife and, 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 and wondering if you can actually get back on course. You might be toward the end, end of your life wondering if there is still time to make it count. And wherever you are this morning, this passage has good news for you. It says that there is hope for anyone. That your dash, no matter how broken your life feels right now, no matter how disappointed your your life feels right now, no matter how things have not turned out the way that you thought, your dash can be filled with goodness and beauty and joy. And the question is how? And that's actually what this text tells us. That's our sermon for today. We're going to consider four things that these four soils tell us about how you can experience a fruitful life, a life well lived. Do you want it? Let's dive into it. Here's the first thing, is that the first soil tells us that you need to to live a fruitful life You need a heart that receives Jesus rather than rejects him. Look at verse 5. Jesus says, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. Now, this first soil, it really isn't soil at all. It's it's a it's 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 a road, it's a hard path. That the seed, the seed can't penetrate the surface. You know, if Jesus was telling this today, he'd probably say, some seed fell along the concrete. And the seed, what is the seed? The seed that Jesus is talking about is himself. It's the message of the gospel. And in verse 12, what Jesus, when he explains who these people are, he says, look, these, these, this first soil, these are people who they hear the message of the gospel and they reject it. Now we have to be very careful here. Because your tendency might be to start thinking about all the irreligious people you know, all the atheists, all the agnostics, you know, all the people who have just kind of outright rejected God. They said, I don't believe in God. I don't need God. But I don't think that's who Jesus is talking about here. Who in the Gospels, who are the people who are most 
hostile to him. Who were the people who were quickest to reject him? You know who they were? They were the religious people. They were the Pharisees. See, there is a type of unbelief that flows out of your religion, for sure. But there is another type of unbelief that actually flows out of a religion. It flows out of a heart that says, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church. I do spiritual things. And yet, you can have a heart that is as hard as concrete towards Jesus. It is a heart that has received him, maybe as a moral example or as a teacher, but it has not received him as Savior. And that is very important because what Jesus is teaching us in this first soil is that a fruitful life, if you want a fruitful life, it doesn't start with 10 steps or 10 techniques. No, it starts with receiving him as he has claimed to be in the Gospels. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Do you hear that? Jesus is saying that the only way to live a fruitful life, a a life well lived, a, a transformed life, a life of love and joy and patience and kindness, it that it it is to receive him into your life. That is step one. And this is where I, I wish that you know we were all in this room worshiping together this morning, because I know right now many of you you would be fidgeting in your seats, you'd be saying, Now wait a minute. I know lots of people, I have lots of friends, I have co-workers, I have neighbors who are not Christians and they are loving people and they are joyful people and they are generous people and they care about justice. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, are you saying, Brent, are you trying to say that there, that, that there are not good people who don't believe in Jesus? Listen, there are lots of good people who don't believe in Jesus. But listen to this. Do not confuse a supernaturally changed heart with someone's natural temperament. See, some people, just by their personality, just by their temperament, just by the the family that they have been, the, the environment that they've been raised in, just by nature of those things, they are more patient or they are more loving. They are more generous. But one of the ways that you know you are growing as a Christian is when you are growing in ways that are not natural to you. It is when you see fruit coming out of your life that is contrary to your makeup or to your disposition. And that is when you know real change is happening in your life, not just superficial behavior modification but real transformation because you have taken the seed of the gospel all the way in and now God can come deep into your heart and change you. Two quick questions here before we move on. First, have you received him? Have you received him, not as your teacher, not as your example, but have you received him as your savior, as your only hope? Friends, if not, You can receive him today. He can come into your life today. Second question, if you have received him, let let me ask you, what is your prayer life like? Do you you ask God to cultivate fruit in your life? John Stott, who's a very famous uh, pastor, he he said this, he he, he said every morning he prayed the same prayer. And this is what he prayed. Prayed, Heavenly Father, I pray that this day I may live in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Your fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, when you pray, do you, just, do you just go to God with your list of needs? I mean, look, look that is right, and we ought to do that. But, but do, you, do you ever ask, is, 
is your prayer life ever involved you asking God to cultivate this fruit in your life? You cannot do this. That's what Jesus says. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You cannot do this. He must do this. He wants to do this in you. So ask him. All right, here's the second thing this passage teaches us about how to live a fruitful life. It says we don't just need hearts that receive Jesus and not reject him, but we need a faith that is deep and not shallow. We need a faith that is deep and not shallow. The second soil that Jesus mentions is in verse 6, and it's a little bit like the first. It is not very conducive to growth. But I want you to notice this, that in verse 6, look at what he says. He says, some of the seed fell, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. This second soil is a little different because the seed experiences some growth. See, there was no growth in the first one. It experiences some growth, but the growth is short-lived. It doesn't last very long. And the reason is because the seed is shallow. It's, it doesn't go very far below the surface. And so when the sun begins to beat down on it, it dies. Why does it die? Because it's not deep enough to tap into any sort of water source. You say, what is this? What is Jesus saying here? Well, just so we don't have to guess... He tells us, he tells us in verse 13, he says, these are the ones who receive the word, listen to this, with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. This is what you might call shallow faith. Shallow faith begins with an emotional experience. See, they received it with joy. But, but it ends when trial comes into your life. And when the emotional and spiritual high goes away, so does your faith. Now, this is some of you watching this morning. This is your story. Things started off so well. But now they've kind of come to a crashing halt. You know, your, your, your career, maybe your career hasn't gone the way that you'd hoped. Maybe you are single for far, lever, far longer than you ever thought, and there are no potential candidates to marry on the horizon. Maybe your spouse has left you. Maybe your children have struggled with things that you never could have imagined. Maybe you have seen people that you love die. And you see, shallow faith, it is like spiritual poison. It's like spiritual poison. When, when you first became a Christian, there was such joy and excitement and you were, you were glad to receive him. But when the heat of suffering and disappointment began to beat down in your life, now you want to reject him. And what shallow faith does is it kills your relationship with God. It's like poison. But it also kills you. <laughs> it kills your own soul. Sha shallow faith leads, when, when, when the sun begins to beat down, when life doesn't go the way you thought, what happens? Shallow faith leads to bitterness. It leads to resentment. It leads to cynicism. It leads to despair. It leads to self-pity. It leads to anger at God and anger at others. And all of the, guess what? All of these things, they are the exact opposite of a fruitful life. Shallow faith, it poisons you and it poisons your relationship with God. But here is the good news. There is another kind of faith that can totally change the way you respond to trial. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Anderson Cooper was interviewing Stephen Colbert. And Anderson Cooper had just lost his mom. He was very close to his mom's. And he, he was talking about this. And they were actually talking about grief and how to navigate grief in this interview. 
And uh, Stephen Colbert began to talk about how when he was 10 years old, he actually lost his dad and two of his brothers in a plane crash. And, and Anderson Cooper had, had heard Stephen Colbert talk about this in another interview, and, and he, he read a quote to Stephen Colbert from that other interview that Stephen Colbert had said, and he said, he said, I listened to that interview, and you said this. You said, I've learned to love the things that I most wish had not happened. And then you said, what punishments of God are not gifts? At this point in the interview, Anderson Cooper begins to break down. And he can barely talk. And he reads this quote from Stephen Colbert to Stephen Colbert. And then he says, through tears, he says, do you really believe that? And, and Stephen Colbert, in that moment, he began to talk about his Christian faith and how, how it had, had it so shaped the way that he dealt with his own suffering. He said this, he said, it is a gift to exist. And with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. I don't want it to have happened. I want it not to have happened. But if you are grateful for your life, which is a positive thing to be, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. And then Colbert said this, he said, think about what you get from loss. You get awareness of other people's loss, which allows you to connect with others who have experienced loss, which allows you to love more deeply and understand what it means to be human and suffer. That is called deep faith. That is a faith that has sunk its roots deep down into the love and the goodness and the mysterious sovereignty of God. See, shallow faith, it lives under the false premise that Jesus wants to make your life easy. That, that's a strange premise to actually hold to because Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. See, shallow faith, it lives under the false premise that Jesus wants to make your life easy. Deep faith clings to the truth that Jesus intends to make you wise and strong in him and that he can use even the hardest things in your life to accomplish that. Here's a very challenging question for you. We're, we're a year into this pandemic. It's been a hard year. People have lost a lot of things. How does your faith compare today to a year ago? Is it, is it more shallow or is it more deep? See, shallow faith, it is surprised by trial. Deep faith expects it. Shallow faith is dependent on, an, on emotional experiences. Deep faith remains even when the emotions wane. Shallow faith makes you want to run from God in trial. Deep faith makes you want to run to Him in trial. Shallow faith makes you less fruitful in suffering because it makes you more angry, more hard, more embittered, more resentful, but deep faith makes you more fruitful in suffering because it makes you more wise. It makes you more compassionate. It makes you more gentle. It makes you more like Jesus. Now, that brings us to the third thing this passage teaches us about a fruitful life and how to have a fruitful life. And here it is. You need a worship that is singular and not divided. Worship that is singular and not divided. Jesus says, listen to what he says about this third soil. He says that the seed fell among thorns. See, this third soil on the, on the surface, it looks ideal for growth. But underneath, hidden below the surface, are other things that are choking out the life of the plant. And what are, what are these thorns? I mean, that's kind of 
a strange metaphor to use. What are these thorns? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 14. He says, they're life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Riches and pleasures. These are some of the main idols that compete for our worship with God. They compete for our affections with God. They choke out our love for Him by giving us a divided heart. So we, we, we say, I love God, but I love these things too. And Jesus is constantly warning about this. He's saying you can't, you can't love God and love these things. I mean, l- listen to what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. This is why we confessed our greed earlier in the service. Jesus is saying this is adamantly opposed to you loving God. Now l- listen, this third soil, it is... It's so different from the second soil because the threat in the third soil, it's not suffering. No, it is success. It's not trial. It is prosperity. It is not life going bad for you. It is life going well for you. This is, here's something very important to recognize. Listen, riches and pleasures, are these bad things? Is money bad? Is pleasure bad? Is having nice things bad? The Bible says no, actually. And and, and, and here's the point. The biggest threat to you living a fruitful life, a well-lived life, it is not your bad things. It is your best things. These are the things that we are most tempted to worship and sink our roots deep down into. See, and we have to be very careful here because I don't know about you, but, you know, when you hear riches and pleasures, you might think only about people who, you know, drive Teslas and take lavish vacations, which if you're like me and you drive a 2002 Camry that is the color, like the Smurf blue, okay, that can make you think that, that what Jesus is saying here doesn't apply to you. But you see, Jesus never lets anyone off the hook. If Jesus just said, you know, that this third seed is being choked by riches and pleasures, well, that would let some of us off the hook. But he doesn't just say riches and pleasures choke the seed. No, no, he said, you see this? He says life's worries choke it as well. He is talking about the worry and the anxiety that all of us have Because we think if we don't get these things or we don't have these things, then we won't be secure in life. That we can't be happy in life. That we can't live a fulfilled life. And that is why right in the Sermon on the Mount, right after Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money, he says this. Very next sentence. Do not worry about your life. He says, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers in the field. Do you see how God cares for them? Do you see how he provides for them? How much more will he care for you? How much more will he provide for you? Listen, the mark of a heart that is not singular in worship, but it is divided in worship, the mark of a heart that worships God and these other things isn't just that you have these other things, it's that you are constantly worrying about these other things. You're anxious. And, 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 and you cannot be both an anxious person and a fruitful Christian. And here's why. Because at its most basic definition, a fruitful life is an others-centered life. It's a life that's not saying, what can I get but what can I give? Not how can I be served, but how can I serve? Not what's going to bring about my flourishing, but how can I help bring about the flourishing of others? When you are constantly worried about your life and your security and your success, you have very little capacity to love other people and to serve other people and to think about other people. And that's why a heart that worships God, that is singular in its devotion, 
is free. You are free from these other things and you are free to love other people. And I hope that you hear this today as God's gracious invitation. You know, when I say you cannot be an anxious person and a fruitful Christian, that is not meant to be harsh. No, this is God's invitation into a life well lived. It's for you to not just live your life forward, but to actually begin to live it backward, to think about the end and work back. Because how many people spend their lives trying to acquire as many toys as possible only to get to the end and realize how little it actually mattered? How many people get to the end of their lives only to look back with a sense of regret and say, you know, I wish I had been a better friend. I wish I'd been a better neighbor. I wish I'd been a better husband, a better better wife. I wish I'd been a better uh, mom. I wish I'd been a better dad. God God is saying, when you worship him, when you build your life around him, when you love him, you start to love the things that really matter which is other people and your life becomes fruitful. It becomes beautiful. It becomes compelling and so attractive to the people around you. Now this brings us to the last, to the last point. How do you live a fruitful life? What do you need? This passage says you need a heart that receives Jesus and doesn't reject him. You need a faith that is deep and not shallow. You need a worship that is singular and not divided. And last, you need perseverance. Jesus says that this last seed, this fourth seed, this fruitful seed, it produces a harvest. How? By persevering. It's the very last thing in the text. You know, think about the image of a seed. Well, why does Jesus use, use that metaphor? Well, growth is slow. Progress is gradual. It takes change, takes a long time. In fact, it takes such a long time that it is hardly noticeable to the naked eye while it is happening. And this is, this is why the Christian life, it is so challenging for us. Because we live in a culture of immediacy. We want things fast. We want fast results. We want fast internet. We want fast takes. We are addicted to social media feeds and to breaking news. We we lack patience with friendships that are taking too long to grow and to deepen. See, but Christianity, it is inherently slow. This is why Jesus uses the metaphor of a seed. It is slow. It is what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It is day in, day out, small acts of faithful, fruitful living. Standing firm when trials come. Rooting out the other thorns in our lives. Meditating on God's word and his promises to us. Living lives of repentance and justice and forgiveness. Dying to ourselves so that we can love our neighbors. See, that is the way of Jesus. And that is the way of perseverance. The first soil in the parable says that to live a fruitful life, you first have to receive Jesus. But this fourth soil is saying you've got to continue in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul says this, So then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him. Perseverance. A long obedience in the same direction. You know, and the question that all of us should be asking is, how do we do this? That sounds hard. How do we persevere? You know, some of you, you feel like your faith is teetering and you are on the edge. 
See, is there anything that could help us and enable us to endure? And for that matter, is there anything that could soften a hard heart to receive Jesus and not refuse him? Is there anything that could deepen my shallow faith? Is there anything that could give me affections for God that are singular and not divided? And if you are asking these questions, there is such hope for you in this passage. Such hope. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus tells this parable, you know what he calls it? He calls it the parable of the sower. We think it's all about the soils. And if you think it's all about the soils, that's going to do one of two things for you. It's either going to make you very afraid if you think you're one of the first three. Or it is going to make you very proud and very arrogant and very smug. You're going to look down on people if you think you're the last one. See, we think it is about us. You know what Jesus says? He says it is about God. It's about the sower. God is the one who enables us to live fruitful lives. See, God is more committed to you, to you experiencing a life well-lived than you are. He is more committed to you living a life of joy and beauty and goodness than you are. God is the one who enables us to live fruitful lives. God is the one who enables us to receive him. We can take no credit for that. God is the one who enables us to withstand trials. And God is the one who enables us to persevere. See, every other religion says, you hold fast to God. But Christianity says, no, 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 no. God holds fast to you. It says that long before you reached out to him, he reached out to you. He reached out for you. And the reason that we can lay hold of him is because he first laid hold of us. Paul says it this way, I press on to make Jesus my own as he has made me his own. Christian friend, you are not strong enough to fall away when God is resolved to hold you. And do you know the links to which he went so that he could hold you? In John chapter 12, Jesus, he's, he says, my hour has come. And then whenever he says that in John's gospel, he's talking about, whenever he talks about his hour, he's talking about the cross. He says this, he says, my hour has come. No seed can bear fruit unless it falls to the ground and dies. Here's the Christian gospel. Jesus is the seed who came into this world and died. And he was buried in the ground so that he could come out of a tomb and into your life and hold you and love you and care for you and call you his own and produce in you a life that is far better and far more fruitful than you could ever dream. Do you want it? Receive him. Look to him. Continue in him. And he will give it to you. Let's pray. Father, what... What good news for us this morning. If only we could hear it. If only we could believe it. If only we could receive it. Would you give us faith to believe this morning? Would you enable us to persevere? For those of us who have not yet received you, we have been holding you at arm's length, but something keeps drawing us in. And here we are sitting in our home, watching church this morning. 
would you, would you help us to open wide the doors of our heart to you? Because you're a God who opens wide the doors of your heart to us. Father, thank you for the vision that you have for our lives, to be fruitful people. Would you call us out of our boredom, out of our selfishness, out of all of the ways that we are just trying to build our own kingdom, and would you help us to see the wonder and the beauty and the magnificence of knowing you, of following you, of serving you, and of doing life with you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to receive an offering. If you're visiting with us this morning, maybe you found us recently online. We're so glad to have you, and we hope we get to meet you soon in person as we're going to begin to regather in this room for worship together in the coming weeks. But uh, we don't want your money today. We're just glad to have you uh, worshiping along with us. For those of you who consider this church your church family, uh, this is an opportunity for us now to respond with our song and our praise, but also with our gifts. And so let me invite all of us now to stand as we do that together.
me invite you to join us now in our sending prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're so glad that you joined us this morning to worship together. We hope that you'll join us again next Sunday at 10 a.m. But until then, let me invite you to lift your hands and receive God's blessing on your life. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.